In this video, I wanna talk about the fallacy of ambiguity, sometimes called the fallacy of equivocation or the equivocation fallacy. My approach in this video is to give you a rough definition, then state the conditions under which the equivocation fallacy occurs, and finally look at a bunch of examples. Here's a rough definition of the equivocation fallacy. Someone commits the equivocation fallacy when they say a conclusion follows from a set of premises, but the conclusion only seems to follow because they haven't properly clarified the meaning of their words. In particular, it only seems to follow because there's an ambiguity in the argument that hasn't been properly clarified. But once the terms have been clarified, the ambiguous terms made clear, then the conclusion does not follow from the premises. That's a lot to take in, so I think one way to understand the equivocation fallacy is that it occurs when three conditions are met. First, there's the ambiguity condition. This one is obvious. You can only commit the equivocation fallacy if there's actually an ambiguity in the argument itself. So we say a expression is ambiguous provided it has at least two distinct meanings. But to give you an example, let's say I tell you I went to the bank. Here the term bank is ambiguous. You don't know if I dropped some money off at a financial institution or if I sat down by the river and ate a sandwich. The second condition is what I call the truth condition. This occurs when the proposition or propositions of the argument are true, but only when the meanings of the ambiguous expressions are held distinct. A simple example of this is if I said, this pencil is light, light has no weight. You would only accept the truth of these propositions if you understood each instance of light as having a distinct or different meaning. Third, there's what I call the univocality condition. This condition is that the conclusion would only follow or at least be taken to follow from the premises if the ambiguous expressions are given a single or univocal meaning. I'll talk more about this condition when we look at some examples of the equivocation fallacy. Now let's look at some examples, and I wanna look at three different types of examples. I wanna look at simple examples, some real life examples, and then one example that's drawn from philosophy or ethics in particular. So let's look at a simple or silly example. This is a classic one. The argument is the average American family has 2.4 children. Liz's family or some individual's family is average. Therefore, Liz's family has 2.4 children. Now this argument is silly, but it definitely commits the equivocation fallacy. To see this clearly, let's look through the three conditions. The first is the ambiguity condition. Notice in this argument, there are two instances of the word average. And the notion average or the word average is an ambiguous word. It can mean a number of different things that are distinct. Next, let's look at the truth condition. Now, the question for the truth condition is, under what reading of the term average would we accept the truth of these propositions that contain this ambiguous word? In other words, how do we understand the term average in each of its instances in order to accept the truth of these propositions? In the first premise, we would only accept this proposition as being true or at least reasonable if we understood average as referring to the statistical mean. That is, if we took the total number of children and divided it by the total number of families. In premise two, however, we take the term average to refer something like the notion of a mode. That is, what is the number of children that most American families have? So this would be something like two or three. Finally, let's look at, at the univocality condition. Here we're evaluating how do we read the term average such that the conclusion follows. Now, the conclusion would only follow if average meant the same thing. That is, if it had the same meaning in premise one and premise two. So the equivocation fallacy puts you in a type of dilemma. You either fix the meaning of the term average, and this allows for the conclusion to follow, but at the cost of having one of the premises be false. Or you use distinct meanings for the term average, which allows you to have true premises, but at the consequence of the conclusion not following from those premises. Here's another simple example. All stars are in outer space. Socrates is a philosophical star. Therefore, Socrates is in outer space. Here again, we have three conditions met. There's this ambiguous term star. Star has two distinct meanings. One can refer to a celestial object. The other refers to a really popular individual. And the conclusion would only follow if star had the same meaning. One more silly example. Premise one, I have the right to watch Netflix. Premise two, if it is right for me to watch Netflix, then I should skip class and watch Netflix. Conclusion, therefore, I'll skip class and watch Netflix. This again is the equivocation fallacy. Premise one is true if right is understood in terms of a legal right. Yeah, that is, you can do it without state interference or fear of punishment by the government. 
Premise two, however, is only really acceptable or considered true if right is interpreted in a different way. Namely, that it's prudentially good for me to watch Netflix. In other words, it would make my life go better. So provided we distinguish or disambiguate this term right, would be the only conditions under which we would accept premise one and premise two. And in this case, notice that the conclusion would only follow if the term right has the same meaning, not the two different meanings needed to actually make the premises true. Let's look at some practical examples. The motivation for this example comes from a student who was working for a politician. That student had some hesitation about putting a particular statistic on an informational flyer. So here's the argument. Politician X created 50,000 new jobs. If a politician creates new jobs, then they are a job creator. Therefore, politician X is a job creator. Now on the surface, this looks pretty straightforward. If a particular politician creates new jobs, then why not call them a job creator? If anyone creates jobs, then that's what they are. However, this argument and the statement that this particular politician is a job creator because they've added new jobs actually involved an equivocation fallacy. Now I want to focus your attention on the term create, because in order for these two particular propositions to be true, we need to understand create in two different senses. Now in the case of premise two, create is understood in a normal sense, which is to add to the aggregate. So if a politician said they added 50,000 new jobs, we would expect them to be saying that they added it to the existing total of jobs. So there would be a net gain of 50,000 jobs. But, but take a look at premise one. Now there is one sense of create under which it is true to say of this politician that they created new jobs, but it's not in the sense of adding to the aggregate or a net gain. Instead, the politician was claiming that they introduced 50,000 jobs that were not previously present, but they weren't adding those jobs to the existing total. So one way of thinking about it is, let's say there was 100,000 jobs and 50,000 people lost their jobs, and that politician added 50,000 more jobs. So you would have no more or less jobs than you started with. So notice that provided the term create has these two distinct meanings, those two distinct meanings would allow premise one and premise two to be true. However, we would only say that the conclusion follows if the term create was used in a, with a single sense, not with these two different senses in mind. Let me give you a second practical example. This example is drawn from J. Eric Oliver's book, Fat Politics. Eric Oliver claims that the definition of overweight changed over time, and this has allowed individuals to fabricate an obesity epidemic in the United States. So Oliver claims that in 1985, the National Institutes of Health recommended that the term overweight be defined as having a BMI body mass index of 27.8 for men and 27.3 for women. But by 1988, the NAIH designated overweight as having a BMI of 25. So Oliver writes that overnight, more than 37 million Americans suddenly became overweight, even though they had not gained an ounce. So how might someone use the shifting definition or meaning of the term overweight to fabricate an obesity epidemic? Well, one might argue that if more and more people are becoming overweight in this country, then we need to devote more money for physical education courses, maybe create governmental organizations to study obesity, maybe subsidize drug companies and organizations that provide pharmaceutical or some other solutions to the problem of Americans gaining more and more weight. Premise two would be more and more people in America are becoming overweight. So we would cite this statistic that between 1987 and 1988, the number of overweight people rose over 37 million. And then our conclusion would be we need to devote more money and time to activities to battle this problem of obesity. But here again, premise one and premise two are true if overweight has two distinct meanings. Those would be the conditions under which we would accept or find reasonable the truth of these premises. The first premise is reasonable or at least debatable if overweight is used with a consistent sense. That is, it has a single meaning. But premise two is this kind of strange claim. It would be only true if overweight is used with this inconsistent or dual sense of the term. In other words, premise two would only be true if the term overweight simultaneously referred to 1987 definition of overweight and 1988 definition of overweight. 
But as usual for the equivocation fallacy, the conclusion would only follow or be valid if there was a single sense of the term overweight being used. So we've looked at simple examples and some practical examples involving the equivocation fallacy. I want to conclude with an example drawn from philosophy. This example is drawn from Mary Ann Warren, and Warren says, consider the traditional pro-life argument. Premise one, killing innocent human beings is wrong. Premise two, the fetus is an innocent human being. Conclusion, therefore, killing the fetus is wrong. According to Warren, this argument is open to a charge of committing the equivocation fallacy. The claim put forward by Marianne Warren is that premise one and premise two are only true or reasonable, or at least non-question begging, if two different senses of human being are used. According to Warren, in premise one, human being is used in a moral sense. In other words, if we were going to restate premise one, we might say it is morally wrong to kill an innocent human member of the moral community. With respect to premise two, Warren says that human being is used in a genetic sense in the terms of sharing the same DNA as a number of organisms. So if we we're going to restate this, we'd say a fetus is an innocent individual that shares DNA with human beings. The claim here is that if premise two wasn't taken in this sense, then it would be question begging. It would define what it means to be a fetus as a member of the moral community, which is the precise issue that's up for debate in the pro-life discussion. I want to conclude by giving you a different way of thinking about, but also summarizing the equivocation fallacy. Arguments are usually evaluated in two main ways. One, we look at the truth of the propositions. What does the argument say, and does the argument say only true things? The second way we evaluate arguments is whether or not the conclusion actually follows from the premises. Does the proposition that we say is the conclusion follow from the reasons given? But when you commit the equivocation fallacy, when you go to evaluate the truth of the propositions, you interpret the ambiguous words or expressions as having different meanings. And you do this to make the propositions in the argument true or plausible. But when we go to evaluate the validity of the argument, whether the conclusion follows, instead here is where we interpret those ambiguous words, not as having a distinct or separate meanings, but as having the same meaning. And only when we do this does the conclusion actually follow or is the argument taken to be valid. 